today's class is go it's class number three. What we are going to do is do a little bit of theory, and then I will come down to the class in person and we'll work on a few practical problems. Also, today I'm going to give you your first homework that you will have to turn in in a week. So this is before next Thursday. In other words, the last day for you to give me back the homework is next Wednesday, okay? And the homework is going to be exercises number one and number two of our list. Yesterday and the day before, what we have been seeing is first, we have been over coordinate systems, Cartesian, cylindrical, and spherical. We have uh, 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 discussed the gradient of a scalar field. We have talked about integral calculus, a little bit about circulations and fluxes, and then we ended up talking about the divergence. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, both uh, the, the gradient and the divergence, let me insist, have a very clear physical meaning, which is actually very relevant to work in electromagnetism. The gradient is a vector that points in the direction of maximum change, actually maximum increase, if you want to also talk about the sense of the gradient, of any given uh, uh, scalar field. All right, so it contains the information about the rate of change locally and the direction where any quantity changes the most uh, or, or, or the fastest, let's say. And then the divergence, we ended up talking yesterday, it's, it's uh, what you get when you get the del operator to act on a vector field. And it's a scalar that gives us an idea of uh, pretty much um, whether around any point in space uh, there is uh, by by any chance a continuity of field lines and what goes in one end goes out the other way or actually the divergence uh, this this is what happens when the divergence is, is zero but if the divergence of a given field is finite be it positive or negative we ended up saying that this is uh, this is only possible if there is any source of the field and by source it means all right hold on a chat a source or a drain so like i said a positive divergence is typically is related to uh, situations when around the point of interest there is a source of field lines and field lines let's say are being born there is a creation of field lines so there are more field lines going out of my region than in because they are actually being generated in the region negative divergence is the other way around when field lines come into the region and they die somewhere they are annihilated okay so it's a really very important uh, uh, let's say physical it, it, it's it's tool for for understanding of any physical uh, source of drains or, or sources of fields and we'll use this for electrostatics very often now uh, today we're actually going to talk about the gauss theorem and hopefully a little bit also about the curl which is the rotational mm? the gauss theorem is also known as the divergence theorem okay and it, it basically tells us i mean you know probably the gauss theorem from math but in physics again it has a very very uh, strong connection to to the um, to to the physics of the fields uh, regarding their sources. Okay, so what the Gauss theorem says is that the integral of a di of a derivative, and in our case, the derivative is going to be the divergence of a vector field over any given region, a volume like this one that I plotted here, this v, which is actually defined by the surface S, is equal to the value of the function over its boundary. This is just the fundamental theorem of calculus, if you think about it. The integral of a derivative is equal to the primitive of this, <laughs> which is inside the integral, evaluated on the boundary. Okay? And as a matter of fact, from the definition of divergence here, uh, uh, in this, uh, let's say, theoretical way that we, we introduced yesterday, that we ended up writing the divergence of a field as the limit around uh, when when you evaluate a little volume around the point p of interest which is super tiny so it goes to zero of uh, one over the volume times the flux of a my vector field over the little surface that surrounds my little volume and then we add this for the whole uh, volume so this means differential volume plus differential volume plus differential volume we do this integral for all these little pieces of, of volume and then we sum all of them so uh, this, as we said yesterday, this, uh, let's say, object, the divergence, the result of this, which is a scalar, gives us the number of vector lines crossing the net surface that defines my delta volume. In other words, it, it's a measure of the net com normal component of a vector field 
uh, over the whole surface. Mm? So if I do a trick, which with the, the guys in the double degree will not like, but we are physicists, most of us, at least I am, and, and actually uh, just, just kind of get this little delta volume all the way into the first term of the equation, right there it's a trick okay but it, it's uh, it's it's actually not 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 too too bad from the mathematical standpoint because i'm still taking the limit when this thing is very tiny um and i'm still talking about the surface s that defines my my little delta v right if i do this and now after that and after doing that i actually sum these contributions for every little volume in my object, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, I just go over my whole uh, uh, V, okay? So in other words, I do the triple integral extended over the whole volume of what's here. And since this is a very, very tiny thing, I can basically say, okay, delta volume when it goes to zero is just a differential volume. So this thing in here is basically this thing in here, but now I'm summing for the whole, I mean, if this is equal for every little differential volume, the sum for the whole volume will also be equal to summing this for the whole surface, all right? But then if I actually sum the contributions, in other words, the net component of my field across a given surface that defines a small volume here, and I go ahead and sum this for every little delta volume, what I'm gonna do is get the net number of field lines coming from the outside of my surface, I mean the whole S minus the uh, total number of field lines going outside on the other side or, or whatever they do. In other words, if I do this flux integral, if I carry on for the whole surface, not for my tiny s around my delta volume anymore, but the whole surface s, then this is actually something I can do. This is the Gauss theorem. What the Gauss theorem says is that the integral of my divergence, hmm, my, my volume integral of the divergence, when it's actually performed uh, carried on out on a, on a whole volume of space, any volume, V, right, can be also made, uh, it's, it's actually identical to the net flux of my field across the whole surface that defines my volume, all right? It's a mathematical uh, theorem, but it, it contains very, very important physics, and we'll use it very often. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, Problem number two of our list that you're gonna do as homework basically gives you a field and says, please uh, demonstrate that the, the Gauss theorem holds for this uh, uh, field, right? So what you have to do is calculate this term and then this term independently and make sure you get the same result and then you have demonstrated that it works. Mm -hmm. So this is again the Gauss theorem. It's going to be very important. And actually you already know it. You have been using it last year in electrostatics, probably in order to calculate the, the flux of an electric field saying that it's equal to the charge inside a given uh, uh, surface. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see that again, but it is basically this very, very theorem when you actually apply it to the electrostatic field, all right? So, um, Again, it's just, uh, let's say, a version of the fundamental theorem, uh, theorem of calculus uh, applied to divergences. Okay, that's it. And then uh, let's talk a little bit about the curl because I want to go into the class and, and again work on a couple of examples that include curls. Yeah? But you know already the rotational. We were supposed to be doing this on Monday, but we'll do it today. It's really just very, very, very fast because you already know this thing. It's not a weird object anymore. The rotational or curl of a vector field Mm. Uh, you know how to calculate it already just with the determinant like that that, uh, that that you have used last year so let's write it down right away uh, just just the, the the let's say theoretical definition if you want to call it this way using our general definition of del operator nabla right remember we uh, gen we uh, have uh, defined our nabla operator like some vector operator that is defined as the limit uh, when the volume around the given point of interest P is super tiny of the integral of my uh, field evaluated on the surface hmm, of the volume. In this case, uh, since I'm, you know that the, the, the cross product is not symmetric when you exchange A, uh, A uh, cross B is not equal to B cross A, there is a minus sign. So we have to be very careful if we apply the the delta oper the del operator sorry to our vector field it has to go always on the same side in other words on this side of the equation we're going we have to put my vector field at the at the right end okay because it comes from the right 
also in this first term of the equation. That's the only thing, so I don't have a problem with the signs. Other than that, I can calculate this thing. Mm -hmm. This is the general uh, um, definition, but then, of course, in Cartesian, you know uh, how to calculate rotationals. It's basically multiplying my NABLA operator in Cartesian cross any vector field A, and this is basically what you get. By the way, here I'm using some sort of uh, shorter uh, notation for the partial derivatives. So my delta x is just the derivative, the partial derivative with respect to x and so on. So I don't have to write so much, all right? And things are a bit more visual. Mm -hmm. That is in Cartesians, right? And, and I'll also show you in a moment how it looks in, in other coordinates. So uh, the rotational of a given field A gives us a physical idea, which is also very important, and it's a measure of how much the field swirls or rotates, spins around the point in question if there is any net rotational component of it. Remember, the divergence was telling us about how much does it even feel spread out of the point. The rotational gives us exactly the opposite. They are in distance orthogonal ideas. Eh? Uh, ideas that are orthogonal to each other. The divergence talks about the spreading out and the rotational tells us about the component that stays around the point of interest of any given field. So they are very complementary in this respect. And just like the divergence was giving us the net normal component of my field of interest around my point P, be it inwards, sorry, outwards or inwards, I don't care, but normal, the rotational will give us the net tangential component of my field around the little surface S that defines my differential volume around P. Okay, so they are just complementary, like I said. And then examples of uh, fields where that would be would have a finite rotational or curl uh, or, or fields that wouldn't uh, are actually quite visual as well. If you have a uniform film, uh, field like this one, uh, and, and you think of, uh, for example, a point P, and you try to calculate the circulation of the field around any closed uh, curve C, just like this one that I plotted in red. Uh, the result is zero because any component of the dot product, for example, along any given uh, uh, piece of my C is going to be compensated by uh, something that, that has exactly the opposite sign some other place along the trajectory. And also the rotational, this field is not rotating around P because there are so as many field lines going on this side or on this side, here or there, so there is no net tangential component around P, the rotational is going to be zero. However, if I have a non-uniform field, and uh, and I actually uh, try to calculate the circulation of A, and I'll tell you in a moment why the circulations are related to rotationals, uh, but around any closed loop like this one, I'm going to get a non-zero contribution because there's always going to be a parts of the, of the, of the um, dot product of field times differential L that are not going to be compensated by, by other things. And here, the rotational actually of the field, if we calculate it, and we're going to do it in a moment with a couple of examples, would not be zero. The, the way to do this, uh, um, uh, just, just from a visual standpoint, is just think of a spinner placed at the point P, okay? Just one of these. If you put a spinner in a field like this, imagine it's just water flowing with an homogeneous flow uniform, this one would not spin because there is so much, uh, as much force pushing on the top than on the bottom, so the thing doesn't. But if you actually put a spinner in a, in a field like this, you would get it to spin. All right? That's what we mean with the net tangential component, which is finite, it's not zero. There would be a rotational there that would not be uh, zero. It would be finite. Okay? So in different coordinate systems, when you don't have all Cartesians, but you have uh, uh, also cylindrical and, and, and um, Spherical, right? This is how you actually calculate the different uh, uh, gradient of a scalar uh, here, the divergence and the rotational, and then the Laplacian, which is the second derivative that we'll see next week. So forget about this last line for a moment. But this is what you get. And and, and again, you don't have to learn this uh, um, uh, table by heart. You, uh, you have a, uh, there is this list you will be able to use in the exams, but you will actually get familiar with using it very often. And it gets a bit complicated when it goes into cylindrical or spherical, but at the very end of the day, you'll see that calculations are not so difficult. Okay? All right, then. I'm going to stop. Um, I'm going to stop here. 
because I want to get down to the class for at least 20 minutes to, to work on a couple of examples. Okay, so let's go ahead with the second part of the class. This is, uh, I'm going to repeat the stuff, uh, just a couple of examples uh, that we did on the Blackboard uh, with the half of you that were in the class and we could not uh, transmit to those of you that are at home this week uh, because of technical problems. I'm sorry, we could not connect the laptop to the internet for that. And uh, so anyhow, I'm, I'm just going to, to say everything I said again, okay? Uh, then, first of all, and I will send an email with this info, but, but so all of you know, a week from today, actually the deadline will be Wednesday at midnight, uh, you have to do the first homework. And this is going to be exercises one and two of your list of exercises. Mm -hmm. The stuff we did in the theory class, you should already be able to, to, to get those done. Uh, first one is about transforming a, a function into um, uh, from cylindrical, I think, or whatever, aspheric, well, into Cartesians. So for this, we're going to comment now a couple of examples that might help you uh, understand what you have to do. And then the second one is about uh, um, just making sure that the divergence theorem works on a given field. For this, you have to, again, just check both, calculate both terms, uh, the first and the second one of the Gauss theorem or divergence theorem uh, for a given field that you have in the enunciate and then uh, make sure they are the same, right? So you have to do these exercises and send them to be through the virtual campus, please, not through email. Uh, the virtual campus has this little icon on the upper right corner, which is like an envelope that you can send me a message. So the, the subject of the message could be something like homework number one, and then just send me either a PDF, a scanned copy, or just some JPG images, whatever you want, as long as I can read it, right? Uh, including exercises number one and number two. So for exercise uh, number one here, it's basically convert a given uh, vector field here, A, uh, to Cartesian coordinates. First of all, you have to identify what, car what coordinate system are we working on. In this case, you have here an angle, phi, and then you have a radial component. So it should be either cylindrical or spherical because those have radial and angular components. And then here again, radial, angle. Oh, it's the same angle. Okay, it's important to know because you know in spherical we have two different angles, but here for the time being, we are only have one. It's calling it phi, but it could very well be the theta, the polar angle that we have in, in cylindrical. Oh dear, and then we have here a UC. This is just cylindrical. So this is a field in cylindrical coordinates. We have to convert to Cartesian. We're gonna talk about this right in a moment. Mm -hmm. And then by the way, the second exercise here, that you have to do, you have here a vector field, which actually, it's an E, which is radial, right, in cylindrical coordinates. You have to verify the divergence theorem for a given volume, and you have here both surfaces uh, that define the volume. It's a, a surface with radius equal one, and then a surface with radius equal two meters. So we are in cylindrical coordinates, is the volume in between two cylinders of radius one and two. And then on the planes zeta, uh, z equals zero and c equal 10 meters. So those are gonna give you the base and the top end of the cylinders. You have to calculate the volume integral of the divergence of this uh, field in this volume, and then check the flux of the field across the surface defined by these uh, parameters and see that you get the same result. That's about it, okay? But anyway, back to what I was gonna say, let's just think for a moment about the exercise number one, uh, convert this field into Cartesian coordinates. Okay, first of all, what do we have here? We have a vector field, A, and now, this vector field uh, uh, um, that we had in the enunciate of the problem or any other vector field for that matter can always be written in different coordinate systems. For example, in Cartesian coordinates. In Cartesian coordinates, my field would have, would look like this, okay? This obviously means that 
the first component, which could be a function of x, y, z, again, Cartesian, times ux plus the second component, which will also be a function of x, y, z, times unit vector along the y direction. Oops, sorry. I just have to get used to this thing. Okay. Plus a third component which would be a function of x, y, and z in the three-dimensional space just uh, uh, multiplied by the vector, uh, the unit vector in the proper direction, okay? So this, in principle, uh, would be my vector field in Cartesian coordinates. Now, very important, the coordinates themselves, Cartesian, spherical, cylindrical, that you use to write the field down, are just a language. They are actually a way of describing the field so we can all be on the same page. However, the field is a physical quantity, something that exists independently of the language I use, okay, to, to, to talk about it, okay? So if I was to write the very same field in a different set of coordinates, the result, the final result, if I was to plot it or whatever, or think about it, would have to be the same object. Just it will be written in a slightly different way. What do I mean here? That all of this, Phil, if I wanted to write it down, for example, in cylindrical coordinates, then it would also have to uh, uh, result in a vector, of course, but it would have three different components. One of them would be the radial component, the other one would be the angular component, theta, and the last one would be the vertical component. Hmm? Are these the same than I had in Cartesians? No, they are not going to look the same because actually each one of them is going to be a function of a totally different set of variables, r, theta, and z in this case. Hmm? The radial component would be all of those uh, multiplied by the radial unit vector, and then I would also have a angular component that would depend on r, theta, and z times the angular unit vector plus the vertical component along the z-axis. That would look like that, okay? And this would be my field in cylindrical components. And actually, it's not going to look the same. I mean, there's obviously the mathematical equation is going to be different. However, if I plot these things, they have to end up giving me the same field lines with the same vectors at every different point of space and the same magnitude and the same sense and the same everything. But just keep in mind that not even the third component here, which would be the the vertical z component in cylindrical and in cartesian components we all we both have the same c uh, um, variable that one would not have to be the same than this one in the even if they have the same unit vector at the end the variables in there are not the same than the ones in there and definitely they don't have to look the same. However, at the very end, it's the very same field. Same if I actually go and plot the field in spherical coordinates. In spherical coordinates, okay, in spherical coordinates, my field A would also be a vector of three components, radial, polar, azimuthal, but again, they are actually things that look like a vector on totally different variables and also with totally different unit vectors multiplying every component of the
field, okay? That would be the spherical coordinates. So those are all going to be uh, different and we have to learn how to go uh, from one to another system. And it's very, very important for you guys to have into account that it's not just that we need to transform the variables and go from x into r or into theta or into phi, but we will also have to change the unit vectors. This, this, or that one. So if anybody tells you to change this vector field A from spherical like this one into Cartesian, it's not just a matter of changing the variables and actually making sure that you get your different components to go from the a function that depends on NYC into a function that goes into R theta phi. But you will also have to make sure that you change those three into those three. For example, if you want to go from Cartesian to spherical. Okay? All right. So how do we do this? I'm sure a lot of you already know how to do this and I actually posted in the virtual campus uh, um, um, some materials that could be useful. Let me show them to you. And there is a lot, a little bit of everything on how you know how you describe Cartesian, cylindrical and, and, and spherical, but the important thing here is that it actually summarizes uh, how do you change from a given set of, of uh, coordinates into others which you can also find in any book including the wikipedia but for example when you want to go from cylindrical into cartesians or all the way around this is how you go from x y z into rho well this is the radial uh, uh we're calling r hmm? in cylindrical coordinates but anyhow they also call it rho uh, phi, which is what we're calling theta, but it's just the polar angle in, in, in cylindrical, there's only one angle, so some people call it theta, some people call it phi, no big deal, and then z is z in both components. Mm -hmm. Or this is how you transform uh, uh, from values of uh, radius and angle into x, y, and then z. So this is how you go from one to the other. Now, if you have to use some transformation to change coordinates into each other that you can actually check with just looking at geometry, Okay, you can. You also need to be able to write down how you transform unit vectors from one system to the other system, and in particular the unit vectors that here they are actually calling them a, a x, a u, a y, a z. This is what we will, what we will be calling u x, u y, u z, or then a rho, a phi, a z. That will be our u r, u theta. Um, Use it. Anyway, this is how they transform from one to the other. Okay, here we have our AX. Let me make it big in case you don't see it very well. Now, unit vectors in the uh, Cartesian system uh, can be written in terms of the unit vectors of the cylindrical system and conversely. So when you change one type of function, meaning one function in one given coordinate system into another one, you need to change both the variables inside the components of the field, but then also the unit vectors. And then, of course, you sum everything up and you, you just wrap up and, and, and uh, operate a little bit so things look elegant in the end. But this is what you have to do for exercise number one. That would be, by the way, for cylindrical coordinates. And then um, you also have spherical coordinates in this in this chapter. So this is how spherical coordinates go from um, um, x, y, c into r theta phi. And then here is how you can obtain uh, uh, Cartesian coordinates x, y, and z from r theta and phi. You guys are familiar with this anyway, but here is just a wrap up. And the unit vectors from one basis transforming the unit vectors from the other basis just using these transformations, which at the very end of the day can be written just like in cylindrical, by the way, just like some sort of uh, transformation matrix. Hmm? Okay, you should have seen this maybe last year in calculus. Um, the, it's not, not really very difficult, it's just geometry. Hmm? Now, there is one other thing 
that we have already seen, and it's that uh, our uh, vector operators, um, uh, meaning our del operator operating on, on a scalar or in a, or a, or on a vector field via a dot product or via a cross product, um, give us, gives us the gradient, the divergence or the rotational of scalar or, or then uh, vector fields. Now, how do we actually calculate those uh, gradient, divergence and rotational when we are not in Cartesian, but we are actually in cylindrical or spherical coordinates. Well, for the same, I have also posted in the virtual campus a cheat list, <laughs> like somebody was saying today, including a, a summary uh, of, of how do those operators look in different components. Let me show it to you for a second so we can go over it real quick. This is what you have. Uh, okay, in the virtual campus. Here you have our our uh, vector operators, gradient, divergence, and rotational. And how do they look when they actually work in uh, rectangular, cylindrical, or spherical coordinates? So, like I, like when I was saying what I was trying to say earlier, when we have a given uh, either a scalar field U which in uh, Cartesian will depend on X, Y, C, cylindrical will be a function of rho phi and c here we're using this phi and rho uh, notation for the radial and the angular component in cylindrical coordinates and in a spherical uh, it could be written as a function of r theta and phi right or else if we have a vector field which will have different components depending on what system we use to write it down then this will be the shape uh, uh, of, of my vector field when projected on the unit vectors of every system okay so um if we can write our vector field as a function of, of, of with, with, with three components, be it whatever system you choose, then the gradient, divergence, and rotational gets expressed. Uh, uh, I mean, can you can write it down using these formulas with partial derivatives depending on the on the different coordinates. We're going to do right now an example on this, so you see much better how it works. Okay, let's do a couple of examples to see how these things actually work. First. Let's assume we have a vector field, which is just this one. Okay, my vector field at every point is just the position. That's it, my R vector, which in coordinates, I mean, um, Cartesian, obviously. It's written this way, and this is my vector field in Cartesian coordinates can be written like this. All right, no big deal. Now, uh, let's assume that I have this vector field and they ask me to calculate two things, which is the divergence and the rotational of the field. And for practice, they also want me to do it in Cartesian coordinates, cylindrical and spherical. Why would anybody ask me to do this three times? Because I want to make sure that I get the same result. If the divergence of a given field is whatever value, for example, zero in Cartesian, it also has to be zero if I calculate in cylindrical or spherical coordinates. And if the and, and if if instead of being null, it's actually finite, for example, it has a value of 20.5 in Cartesians, it also has to have the same values in the other ones. At the end of the day, the field is the same object and the divergence understood as how much the field spreads out uh, any given point X, Y, Z has to have the same value, no matter what language I use to calculate, okay? so. This is going to be the exercise. Given this field, let's calculate divergence and rotational of the field uh, in uh, um, Cartesian, cylindrical, and then spherical coordinates. And then we will also comment on, on the what can we learn about those numbers regarding the, the, the field itself. Is it a rotational field? Is it a field that is purely divergent? Can we know anything from the numerical values of rotational and uh, or curl? or divergence remember what we said earlier the divergence is actually the the net 
a normal component out of a given volume for my field, a wrong P, and then the rotational would be the net tangential component. So that is the part of the field that stays around P rotating. And the divergence is the part of the field will tell us about the part of the field that actually escapes. Okay, so those are two completely independent, orthogonal, and very important pieces of information. Hmm? So, first of all, in this case, if we want to calculate the, the divergence and the rotational of the field in all of these three different coordinate sets, we have to be able to first write the field in those three coordinate sets uh, independently. Okay, so in Cartesian, I already did, that is easy, and this will be what I have here. Hmm? the Cartesian shape of my field is that one, all right? Uh, the, the way it looks, uh, Cartesian or, or rectangular, whatever coordinates. But now, how about if I want to write it down in cylindrical, for example? How does it look? Hmm? Well, let's, let's think. I mean, this is actually a very easy field, so you don't really have to uh, uh, make weird transformations. You could, you can try. But this is something we can just think about for a moment. And at the very end of the day, maybe we can get it without doing a lot of math. And please get used to think in this uh, subject. You're going to need to be able to, to kind of uh, um, think a bit before calculating. Let's assume we have our uh, XYZ uh, axis here. And we have a, a given point here, P, that one. And there is a position vector going to my point. Okay. Now, obviously, in Cartesian coordinates, I already know how to um, represent this field. Hmm? Let's go back to our drawings for a moment. Okay, this is our Cartesian coordinate systems, and therefore my R vector going to point P will have three components, which will be the projections along the three orthogonal axes. Right? Now, if I go to cylindrical. How do I actually get to uh, write down the position of a given point P with the three uh, angles of interest, R, phi, or theta, uh, and Z? Mm? Actually, phi may be a more convenient angle to use because it's a, at the end of the day the same angle that we have in, in um, spherical. So let's call it phi. That's fine. No, no big deal. One way or the other, you have to get used to different notations. Okay. So anyway, how do we actually write a vector that goes all the way from the origin here to my point P there? Let me draw it for a moment. This would be my vector R. All right, the same vector that goes from the origin of coordinates all the way up to P. Hmm? How would I write this down in cylindrical coordinates? What do you think? Remember, my cylindrical coordinates must have a radial component, which is this distance, now an angular component, and then uh, they should have also uh, a z component. How do I actually get this vector to work? Well, actually here it's quite easy. It's a vector that's going to have a vertical component, which is also z, okay? And then it's going to have a radial component, which is just basically uh, this distance. And this is what we are calling R, okay, or rho, if you want to, in some other books. So I can actually get to write my, um, my vector this way. In cylindrical components, I could actually do, okay, R is my radial distance, zero, I don't need an angle there, and then the last one would be just Z. In other words, R times the radial vector plus no angular component plus that. Is this correct? Yes, it is, because if we go back to our drawing right here, let's assume that this is my projection, this distance is what I am calling R, multiplied by the unit vector UR along the radial direction, which is getting away from the Z axis, but in this 
let's say xy plane so it's a flat vector right there if i actually sum this with the vertical component which would look like that i actually get the proper vector that i'm looking for so this would be the way to actually go ahead and plot or write the field in cylindrical um, um, coordinates. Good. How about spherical? How do I write the field in spherical coordinates now? Well, actually, this one is quite a lot more straightforward. Hmm? In spherical coordinates, remember that we have three variables which are the distance to the origin, the azimuthal angle, the third one, and then the polar angle will be my second component. In other words, remember our drawing. Now here, in spherical coordinates, if I want to actually write down the, uh, um, the position of my point P, since my radial vector, in this case the unit radial vector, points from the origin all the way up to my point P, which is at a distance r from the origin, that's all I really care about. I can actually write this vector down by just having one component in spherical coordinates. And this would be like this. My field in spherical components, A, would actually have a radial component, which has a modulus equal to r which is the distance from the origin all the way up to my point p and no need for anything else what is this if you want to write it down would be r times u r plus nothing else i love these fields when they are full of zeros this is just so much easier to calculate as we'll see in a moment this is a in spherical components. And if you compare, mathematically speaking, with only one variable and only one unit vector, this way of writing my field with the cylindrical expression that needed two variables and two unit vectors, or even the uh, Cartesian expression here that needed three variables and three vectors, well, when we have anything that looks like a, a, a radial or spherical symmetry, we'll always use uh, spherical um, components, okay? So anyway, this said, now we have to calculate divergence and rotationals of these things. So first of all, let's go for the divergence. In Cartesians, cylindrical and spherical. Cartesians is really very, very, very easy. If I have my field in Cartesian coordinates, then the divergence of it is going to be the derivative of the first component with respect to x plus the derivative of the second component with respect to y plus the derivative of the third component with respect to z. What is this? Derivative of x with respect to x is a 1. Derivative of y with respect to y is 1. And then derivative of z with respect to z. And we're talking about partial derivatives. 1 plus 1 plus 1 equals 3. So the divergence of my field is not 0. It's finite and it equals 3 when I calculate it in Cartesian coordinates. There we go. How about if I actually calculate in cylindrical coordinates? Hmm? What would be the value? If I look at my divergence in cylindrical components, it's this thing. Hmm? I have to calculate 1 over r derivative partial derivative with respect to r of r times the radial component but my radial component here equals r so here i will put r times r r square plus one over r derivative of the angular component 
with respect to the angle. I don't have an angular component, so this term is not going to exist hmm? in my particular case right now. And then I have uh, the third component, uh, Fz, or in my case, Az. For me, this is actually Z, derivative of C, with respect to C. This is what I have to calculate. In cylindrical components, I have to do this. 1 over R, derivative of my first component times r, but my first component again is r, so that would be r squared, plus second term is zero, plus the third term is the derivative of the third component of the field with respect to c. Now I can calculate this. It's diff not difficult. That's 1 over r times 2r, because the derivative of r squared is 2r, right? Plus zero, plus 1. And what is the result? Those go out, 2 is left, and then I have to sum 1, 3. The divergence of my field calculated in cylindrical coordinates is equal to 3. Surprise, surprise. Let's go back. Aha, same result that I had before. In Cartesians, I get a result of 3, and so I do. So do I when I calculate in cylindrical coordinates. Okay? It's the same field if, if, even if I'm using a different language. It has to give me the same result. Mm -hmm. Now, they also say calculate the rotational. Rotational in Cartesian. Sorry, I'm going to slow. This is a little bit boring, but uh, we'll do it once and only once, and then you should know how to do it for the rest of the semester. Cartesian coordinates. All right, let's calculate this. You know how to calculate rotationals in Cartesians a lot better than I do. It's basically this determinant that we need to solve. Hmm? Partial derivative with respect to x, partial derivative with respect to y, partial derivative with respect to z. And now I have my vector field down there. First component in Cartesian, second, third. Okay. Okay. Now, what is the result of this? It doesn't take a lot of work to see that the result is zero. Let's see. For example, the UX component, that's the only one I'm going to do because then you'll see the other ones also go to zero, also vanish, will be UX times this determinant. And this is partial derivative of z with respect to y minus partial derivative of y with respect to z times ux. Then second, third, same thing. Result, zero. Okay, it's a zero for obvious reasons. If you try to uh, do these derivatives, the partial derivative of z with respect to y is zero, and so is the other one. It's going to happen the same in the other components. So the rotational of a equals zero when you calculate in Cartesian components. Now, what if we do it in um, cylindrical components? Here it is. This is the way the rotational looks in cylindrical. Mm -hmm. And you can actually look this up in books. Uh, somebody was asking in the class, in the classroom, while I was explaining on the blackboard, where does this come from? Whether we cannot write the rotational like a determinant? And uh, the answer is yes, we can. I'm gonna write it down for you right now. You can find it in any calculus books or even in the Wikipedia if you want to. Let's do it. How do you write the rotational in cylindrical coordinates just as a determinant in order to arrive into that formula that you have in the cheat list, which in the end is what you, the one that you will be looking at. Okay, this is it. Rotational in cylindrical components. It's actually written this way. 1 over r radial component times the determinant of ur and then r times u theta or phi, whatever angle you want to use, and then use this. Oops, sorry. I want to close the determinant right there. Hmm? 
These are here multiplying the u theta, by the way, make sure that this has dimensions of distances. Second line, partial derivatives. Third line, my field with the three components. All right, in cylindrical coordinates. This is how you actually write down the determinant that gives rise to that formula in the cheat sheet, in the summary that you have now in the virtual campus. So in particular, for our case right now, if we actually want to calculate this, uh, it doesn't take a lot of work to see that it also vanishes and goes to zero. For example, the first component here, green is a good color. The radial component, we need to get done this little box here and multiply the UR, okay? But then what do we have here? Differential, sorry, uh, partial derivative with respect to theta of what? Of z. Mm -mm. I can already start thinking that this is not going very far. Minus the derivative with respect to z of what? Of zero. And this will be the radial component of my rotational. Obviously, this vanishes and so does this one. There is nothing. If you do the same thing for the rest, meaning the theta component, this one with that one, or the z component at the very end, it doesn't take a lot of time for you to realize that all of this ends up summing up to nothing, in other words, zero. Hmm? So the rotational in cylindrical coordinates is exactly giving me the same result that in Cartesian components, all right? Well, in spherical, again, you can go back to your list or you can just, if you want, I can write just for once the, the way the things work in, in uh, when you want to have the determinant. So the rotation line is spherical coordinates. Let me come here so I have space. R square sine theta. Then U R. And then R U theta. R sine theta U phi. Hmm. You can find this in the books, OK? And then the partial derivative with respect to the three variables. And now I put my field here. So it doesn't take a lot of work to see that this actually vanishes and goes down to zero. Check it. I'm not going to do it because this is already taking too long. But just go ahead and check. So the rotational of my field is actually zero no matter how I calculate it. What will I do typically? Well, just go ahead and use the most uh, uh, convenient way to calculate, which in this case actually happens to be spherical. And if instead of looking at this long determinant, which is not really very useful, you just go back and look at your cheat list. How would you have calculated, for example, this rotation line in spherical coordinates? Here it is. My A field, which is here, what I'm calling F, has a radial component FR, which is R, and then f theta and f phi are zero. So all of the things, this term with an f phi, this term with an f theta is zero, and then this one here as well is zero, this one as well is zero, all that survives is basically, this one has an f r, but then it equals r in my case. So when you differentiate that with respect to phi, that's a zero as well. And here I have the derivative of f r, which is r with respect to theta. This is all zero, okay? So that will be my rotation. So what do we have for this field? It's a field that has a divergence equal to three, no matter how I calculate it, I get to the same result, and a rotational equal to zero. This is a field that has no rotational component whatsoever. All of it is divergent. 
Well, of course, it's the, it's the position vector. It's the basically the vector field that can get away from zero all the way out to infinity for the fastest possible way, which is the radial direction. This is the down, this is down the, the, the fastest possible path to diverge. It's basically going radial. Mm? There is no, no, no fastest way to escape from the origin. It has no rotational and it has, um, obviously, all of it is diverging. Mm? So, uh, that's an interesting example. And then we can actually go for a second example, just to finish. Second example. Let's go for a slightly different kind of field. In this case, let me see. Mm -hmm. So I get it right. I'm going to call my field B in Cartesian coordinates. It's basically going to be minus y times ux plus x times uy and this is an interesting field as well for different reasons in cartesian coordinates that's the way it looks in cartesian coordinates hmm? can you try write it down in cylindrical and spherical hmm? maybe just using the transformations or oh, maybe just using uh, logic, okay? See whether you can get it. Because this, this is already taking too long, but maybe how would you do this uh, so that you have a... representation like that in cylindrical? Okay, do you wanna try? How would you do it in spherical? So what you actually have in that case is that. Wanna give it a try? Please do, I have the solution here. So if anybody wants to just send me an email and say, hey, is this right? Then I can, I'll be happy to, to answer, hmm? but then, there is an interesting thing about this kind of field that I want to do. And it's not just, again, doing the whole thing in spherical and cylindrical and say that you get the same thing. It's interesting about this field that has nothing to do with the coordinate system, and I really want to go over it. So let's just calculate the divergence of it, in this case, in uh, Cartesian, which is the fastest. It doesn't take a lot of time to see that it has zero divergence. This is my field right here. If I put this into the definition, that would be the first contribution. That would be the second. Oh, there is no divergence. If you write the field down into spherical or cylindrical coordinates and you apply the proper uh, expression for the divergence in those coordinates, you will get to the same result. This field has no divergence. It doesn't escape. It doesn't spread out from my point. How about the rotational? Okay, let's read the Cartesians first. And then, this is the determinant that you guys have to solve. Hmm? Well, um, let's say the X component basically is going to be, this is a zero and this is a zero. Hmm? The, the, the derivative of something which is zero with respect to any variable is zero, and then the derivative of x with respect to z is zero. It has no x component. Plus, y component, here, the derivative of x, oh, sorry, the derivative with respect to x of zero is zero, and then minus the derivative of minus y with respect to z is also zero. 
Second component, it's also vanishing. Mm, I like things that vanish. But then, if we actually get to the third component, right here, and look at this box, things don't vanish anymore. Mm. So if I actually calculate it, what I have is the derivative of x with respect, with respect to x, and this is equal to 1, minus the derivative of minus y with respect to y, which is minus minus 1. So what is the result of this? The rotational of A is minus 2 times uc. In other words, finite, not zero. So we have a field in summary, and this is what I wanted to comment before finishing, that has zero divergence and finite rotational. That is something. Zero divergence means that the field does not escape. The field stays around my point of interest, for example, the origin. And the finite rotational field means that it has a net, a not non-zero uh, tangent component, uh, if you think of a closed loop around my point. Mm. So if we can think of every possible vector field just like the superposition of a normal and a tangent component, which are always going to be perpendicular to each other, no matter what system or frame of reference you use. Mm. Any vector field can be composed, decomposed into a projection of normal and tangent components. The tangent component pointing outwards or inwards if it's negative is what we get from the divergence. The I said the normal component, yeah? And then the tangent component that stays rotating around my uh, uh, point of interest, this is what we get from the rotational. So divergences and rotationals together tell us a lot about fields and their geometry. Fields that have zero rotationals are called irrotational fields, irrotationales, purely divergent fields. Fields that have zero divergence are called solenoidal fields because they actually are like a solenoid they are always rotating around any given point mm -hmm. there can be fields that have both components but no matter what we will always be able to decompose any given vector field into a sum of those two mm -hmm. normal components meaning diverging components and then uh, um, tangent components which are actually rotating around my field and this is very very important and this is what the Hemholtz theorem uh, is going to be about uh, pretty much next week okay so with these examples uh, the class is over remember that you have to do the homework number one and number two exercises for next Wednesday Wednesday through the virtual campus I'll send it in an email right now anyway and uh, well, it shouldn't take a lot of work but it's good practice for you okay all right